Before we get started with today's show, I'm here to tell you about Brez Coffee Company, made by gamers for gamers right here on the Gulf Coast in Pensacola, Florida. Do you like lighter medium roast? Then try the Necro Medium, Holy Grail Light, or Stamina Boost. Or if you're like me and prefer darker roast, try the Critical Dark or the Coup Slayer Mocha Roast. But what if you can't pick just one? Then try one of their specialty sample packs, perfect for an all-night gaming, or in the case of my fellow filmmakers, an all-night editing session. Forget about all the crappy coffee you've been buying at the grocery store and head on over to BrezCoffeeCo.com. Use the promo code DDE at checkout to get 10% off your order. Have you ever thought to yourself after listening to this podcast, why didn't Derek ask this question? Or why didn't he ask that question? I know I certainly have. Well, you get the chance to do that if you sign up for my Patreon at patreon.com slash ddiamondpodcast. You get the chance to ask guests of the show a question. If you're a fan of the top five list, you get the chance to vote on what the topic will be. You also get early access to episodes, accessibility to my film scripts, and so much more. And you can do so by heading over to patreon.com slash ddiamondpodcast. And we want to thank our patrons, Tim Spivey, Donna Diamond, and Shannon Williams. Thanks so much for your continued contributions. And now, on with the show. Welcome to the Derek Diamond Experience Podcast, where every week I take a look inside the world of film and television with those who have lived it and experienced it. I am your host, Derek Diamond, and coming up on today's show, you'll be hearing my conversation with filmmaker Gigi Hozima, and this is one of, if not the most fascinating conversation that I've had in 330 plus episodes of doing this show, just in the sense that her background and where she came from, from living and growing up in Saudi Arabia to moving to England to study film and having to learn the English language and getting to where she is now is a prime example of why I love podcasting and why I love hearing these conversations because you never know what you're going to learn and what you're going to hear when you listen to them, whether you're participating in them, whatever the case may be. And this is a prime example of that. And I I loved hearing Gigi's story. So hopefully you all enjoy it just as much as I did being a part of it and listening to it firsthand. And I will talk a little bit during the intro about um, the announcement I made last week regarding the future of the show. So stick around for that after this conversation. But without further ado, here is my conversation with Gigi Hosima. And we're back with my very special guest this week, filmmaker Gigi Hosima. Gigi, how are you? Very well, thank you. How are you, Derek? Fantastic. And I, I was telling you before we started recording, you know, when uh, when Tamron set up this interview and I was reading some of your background, I was blown away by your story and how you got to where you are now. And that's the beauty of podcasting is, you know, I get to have conversations with fellow filmmakers and really learn how they get to where they are because it's such a unique path. And I think yours may be the most unique one that, that I've ever read about. So I, I wanted to first say uh, thank you so much for, for taking the time to, to do the show. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm really excited uh, to be here and thank you for uh, finding my story interesting. No, for sure. So uh, talk to me a little bit about uh, your background, because you you grew up in in Saudi Arabia. What was that like for you? Did you grow up with a big family? And was it from an early age that you kind of discovered your love of film and entertainment? Yes, that's correct. I was actually born in uh, the holy city of Mecca. Uh, I am number nine between a huge family. Like mom and dad had uh, no time, basically. We had 10 kids. I am number, you know, number 10. So um, my upbringing, it, it was very interesting in sense because I was growing up in a very conservative uh, country. 
um, conservative family. You know, uh, dad was uh, uh, successful. You know, we, uh, we didn't struggle financially at the time and everything was, you know, it's kind of, um, I, I still remember, I think it's just like this memory of like having everyone at uh, a special occasion getting together. And it was like a really huge family. It's like a, almost like a school. <laughs> you would think about it. That, uh, you know, that being said, it's also was, uh, I always been a rebel, you know, like I always wanted something different, you know, from a uh, very early age. Um, I wanted to be a belly dancer. Uh, I wanted to be Michael Jackson, uh, you know. Um, that was, uh, you know, growing up in Saudi Arabia as a girl is, is it, let me put this in the right word. I would say it is interesting, you know, it's, it's hard. You know, it's a conservative country, right? So I, I personally didn't experience was my other sisters and brothers, for example, experience, you know, because I was the little one, the favorite one. And um, I always wanted to do something different. And I discovered that through my schools, you know, especially high school, uh, where I was more drawn to art and, you know, paint and uh, naked bodies and stuff like that. And I was suspended so many times. God knows how how many times I was suspended. Um, but um, I just start to realize that when I start to uh, get into my teenage years, that I was a little bit different in sense. Uh, you know, maybe I'm not different here if I was, you know, born here and stuff. Uh, but if you are in Saudi Arabia in the eighties. That wasn't possible, you know. I was a little bit of an outsider and a rebel throughout my uh, my life in Saudi Arabia, which is cut really short because when I was uh, 17, I uh, decided to go and study in England. Um, so uh, I always had that relationship with mom, you know. Just uh, she kind of knew what I am and who I am, uh, and she supported me through that. Um, so I owe her quite a lot, you know, her and my sister, actually, they supported my ambition, they gone out of their way. Um, unfortunately, uh, I lost my mom very early age, uh, at the age, I think, of 17. So that was, uh, I think this, if, uh, probably if mom didn't, you know, didn't die, would be in Saudi Arabia. Uh, maybe just like being an ordinary, you know, housewife or a teacher. I don't think to myself housewife. So I would be always doing something. So, but you know, uh, it's interesting. And um, I drove all the way to England and start my, uh, you know, my study there. I struggled quite a lot, you know, um, going all the way from a, a girl that she never left her little uh, city to London. That was really an experience. So, but it is, it is an experience, and I'm I'm very thankful that I had that uh, experience growing, uh, born in, and growing in Saudi Arabia, because it makes me appreciate uh, everything I do right now. Right, and I'm sure the fact that you know, you had someone in your family, you know, talking about your mother, supporting you, and you know, she her recognizing that in a way you were meant to do something more. And yeah. supported that. I, I'm sure it had to be, you know, an invaluable asset. Oh yeah, hell yeah. I mean, like, <laughs> imagine like you were, were as a kid. You know, when you're a child, you really have your mom to give you. It's like your mom is the world. If she said okay, you're gonna go for it. If she said no, then you're gonna change your direction. But uh, she also had like some kind of a creative interest. She always wanted to be a singer. And she had a beautiful voice for singing, but at the time it, it was impossible. You know, she got married to dad and they had family and stuff like that. So yes, I mean, uh, I remember my sister said to me once when I was really sad because I didn't, you know, I didn't do well at the school at the time. She said, you know, as long as I support you, you will succeed. There is, it, there is only, you're only gonna succeed if you have support. And I was very blessed. Uh, was just two women um, that I have in my life, or one of them at least still there. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, talk to me about you. Know, you mentioning you went to England to to college, basically to university. 
what was that transition like for you and, and, and how different was it compared to where you grew up? Oh my God, Derek, it was disaster. <laughs> so, um, all right, this is what happened. Uh, a 70 years old girl decided to go and study in England uh, in a, a country that she doesn't speak the, the English at all. So uh, I didn't actually, I only knew some basic of English language, okay? And uh, I even ignored all the advice of taking any foundation here or stuff like that. I was like, no, that's it. I'm going to go and study at Ikela University. Well, uh, it took me five years later, five years to get into university because uh, when you don't speak English, you have to go through countless tests and language, you know, uh, to make sure that your English is up to university standard, right? So I, I really was so shocked. Uh, I feel like my body was there, but my soul, uh, my understanding, my um, appreciation to a totally different culture, you know, because once you learn, when you start learning a language, you don't just learn the language, you learn the culture. You learn these people who are grown up in totally different environment. They have different uh, understanding, uh, how you relate to each other, you know. And um, I felt so lonely there, of course, you know, I felt so outsider, um, especially with so many different things was going on in the period between, yeah, I think so, it was two, uh, 2000, uh, it was 2001 or 2002, 9-11 uh, just had then, you know, and I, when I went there, I was wearing a scarf, my head a scarf. I was going with that for about a few years like two years, um, that was until I was 22. And then the, the, the hate they took, it was unbelievable, Derek. It was really painful. Um, for somebody, somehow I was like 19 at the time, 22, but I was innocent in the sense like, when you come from that environment, protected environment, you know, I never paid bill, I never, I had my own, I didn't know how to open a bank account. I didn't know how to boil the name or to do anything for myself. To go to that independency, this was shocking for me. And the, the world outside didn't make it even easier because when, as, as you know, as a person with Islamic belief was, you know, as a head of scarf, that was horrible. I had so much um, hateful events towards me. Um, at the time I didn't understand it, but now when I look back, I see it in, in a more adult, uh, you know, understanding. Um, I went to university. I, it took me three years to get into the test and I keep studying. I struggled so much. Oh my God, Derek, you have no idea. When you have an Arabic girl going to England, trying to make a life by herself with no English, all right? The language is really, really a uh, um, struggle was for me is it, it was like a, a disaster really. But, you know, I'm very thankful that I learned. I managed to get into uh, Southampton uh, University. Um, I finished my BA and I got interested in this wonderful world that thanks God I'm here because it is filmmaking. And I did my um, filmmaking master at Kingston University and moved here to America. Well, and I, something I wanted to point out, and I, I think you're, you might be the best example of this that you know, I've talked to, not just on this show, but in my you know, 35 years of being on this earth, I've been told by you know, people I've met that are from other countries that everyone should experience another culture at some point in their life, if it's for you know, a week or you know, some type of period of time to just like you mentioned, learning the English language, you didn't just learn the language, you learned the culture. But you know, what, what you did, I think, just speaks such volumes to not just your character, but your drive as well, because you could have very easily just went back home, but you didn't. You, you kept moving forward and getting to where you are now is just, it is, is so inspiring. And I, I, I give you all the credit in the world for that. I, that that's an absolutely amazing story. Thank you, Derek. Don't make me cry now. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> so we'll, we'll 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 move on to to uh, the next thing. So you, you you're in London. You study to go into filmmaking. What was it specifically about filmmaking that drew you to it? Like what what kind of to backtrack a little bit? What access did did you have to to films like say American films in Saudi oh. Arabia? Because you know you said you grew up in the eighties, which is to me, one of the best eras of filmmaking that's ever been. So were, were you exposed to a lot of American films growing up? Well, surprisingly, yes. Uh, so my, uh, as a Saudi, I, I'm just going to talk in general, as a Saudi people, we love films. You know, we love, um, it's, for us, watching film, it was like, uh, how do you call it? Easy, uh, speak easy kind of things, you know? Like we're gonna download it, we're gonna do this, and secrets and stuff, and this is back in the 80s. Personally, I watch a lot of films. Um, mom and my brother and sister, they really love Jackie Chan. I know Jackie Chan is, uh, is not American, but that in that time, Rambo, uh, you know what? Evil Dead. I watch oh, Evil Dead when I was... Yeah, I know, right? It <laughs> terrified me to hell. So yeah, I, I always had access to, to American films, you know? Um, I always like, uh, the whole family, it's not just me. Like even mom, dad, the, we say that also. So, but the only thing that it wasn't there is the possibility of that, you know? It's like, I never thought to actually like be filmmaker or anything like that. Uh, I didn't even understand what, Filmmaking is. Um, so, you know, until recently, Saudi Arabia didn't have cinema, so that is also out of the way. We only had the TV, and we are t- uh, people in um, Saudi Arabia grown on TV. So that was uh, shown on TV. And yeah, I, I love films, but at the same time, I was always curious about how did they do it? You know, how, how did they do it? Okay. That was my question when I was about seven or eight. I, I totally forget about it because I wanted to be a belly dancer and then I wanted to be a professor and then God knows what I wanted to be. But then I had that, uh, I remember there's this story uh, when once my brother bought this big camera and they were trying to you know, film each other and stuff. And I immediately kind of, talk, you know, I wouldn't say like I knew what I was doing, but I really enjoyed watching them doing what they were doing, you know, acting and doing stuff between each other. So, uh, yeah, it, it was very accessible, but uh, not to any limit like what we have now. You know, I'm very proud. I'm very happy that Saudi Arabia now have cinemas because, oh, my God, the first time I, Derek, the first time I walked into a cinema, I felt something very, very strange, you know, like being in the, exclusive watching that work that person face listening and that and you know what by the way the first films i've seen i didn't understand the language either so it was translated in english and i didn't speak english so all of that is just like i don't know it just happened to be i think you know i just uh, i just attracted to that magic and that's usually where a filmmaker's journey starts is they they i, I call it being bitten by the bug yeah, it's just that that little moment happens to where you're like, that's what I want to do. Yeah. And um, I always think like in our life, we this is the math about it. Like, oh, I'm going to be A, B, C, D, right? You go to college, you finish. But um, in my 39 years uh, of life on this earth, as you said, I know now it doesn't work this way. It works ABC and let's go to Mars, let's go to uh, uh, China, let's come back, let's break up, let's get married, let's get divorced. And then, oh my God, you like to do films. You know, it's always like in that kind of circles to find yourself. Uh, It's very important uh, for me that I have discovered myself throughout my life event because filmmaker has to experience life. You know, you can't make films and you're sitting in your own bubble. You can't tell your own story and connect with your audience and you know nothing about these people, uh, about life, about disappointment, about uh, rejection, about just, uh, you know, total really uh, 
horrible events, you know. You have to feel that you've been um, wronged to, in order to know how to make a story, it's good stories, I'm talking, good filmmakers, you know. So yeah, I, uh, I, knew, I knew actually just throughout, like it's almost science, you know, it's not like a direct answer, it's here and there and here and there. And I, I, I love this idea of not trying to be a filmmaker. You know, like I, I don't say I have to be, it just happened. I work for it, don't get me wrong. I invest in it because I love it. As, as soon as, like, as long as you love something, that is, is effortless, I think. No, I, I completely agree. I think you're absolutely right. Yeah. Uh, so you, um, you get into filmmaking and you directed your first feature film, um, He Belongs to Us, which was released in 2019. Uh, what was the biggest lesson that you think you learned from making your first feature film? So I have learned a um, few lessons, if you don't mind sharing. Yeah, yeah. I have learned number one is to be careful, really careful who you bring to your table, who you work with, you know, because a lot of people out there uh, thinking that like I learned to, have, to be careful who I cast, who I work with, who I trust, because I think filmmaking is one of this obscure kind of profession. You have to work with people who you trust and they trust you. you they know, especially as a, a director, they know, they believe in you. You know, they believe that you will lead them and this, their hard work is not gonna be gone for, you know, nothing. You know, so you have to select who you work with. You have to work with people who they like you, they appreciate you, they admire you. Other way, you are setting up yourself for trouble. You know, if you're just doing that because this is available or this is cheaper or this is, oh, good looking, or this is, no. I think so you have to think of your film. Number one, that, uh, it is a, a foundation, but like my first film was a foundation. Who I'm gonna work with, yeah? I worked with, up to now I work with uh, uh, my cinematographer, Adida, uh, Christian J. Pantu, uh, a great guy and I send him all love. Um, he is a great asset to me. I, I love him and he is wonderful. But Christian and I will work together really, really well and I trust him with that. Uh, so working with somebody you trust and be very, very selective. Yeah. The second one I learned, honestly, is just go for it. Don't ask anyone permission to tell you, I think your script worth the money. I think your, no. If you're going to ask for permission, don't bother, don't do it. Just do what you want to do. That's all. Like, um, if you can ask permission for anyone, don't be a filmmaker, really, because it's, uh, it's, a, it's, it's nobody will, will give it to you. You have to work for it. So this is the two main lessons I learned. So. No, I love that. It's like that old saying, sometimes it's better to ask forgiveness than permission. So Absolutely. I agree with you. And think about it, Derek. Like, honestly, the... <sighs> You have to believe in yourself first. You have to put your own money in your film first. And this is what I did. Like he belongs to us. I tried to fundraising and it didn't work because who, who cares, you know? Like, oh my God, she's making films. Hundreds of people are making films, yeah? I actually had to put my own money. And the same I did for that abandoned place for many new films I come to. I sold my wedding dress, I did. I sold my Tiffany ring, I did, that's fine. I have to believe in myself. And then I ask people. People don't owe me anything to believe in me. I have to prove to myself first that I can do that. And this is very important. This is a mentality that I hope that will work. You know, because there's nothing 100%, right? 
whenever you think there's a hundred percent life gonna screw you later on. But anyway, <laughs> that's what I think. Well, and that's definitely true that you know, you have to believe in yourself that that you can do it because it, it makes me think back to when I did my short film that I was telling you about, you know, when, before we started recording, I had thought about doing a crowdfunding for that, but I thought to myself, you know what, I'm just going to do it on my own. So I put my own money into it and also, you know, used resources. Like I, I knew of the type of house I wanted to use where most of the film was going to take place. So I just, and I knew the people who lived there. So I just simply asked them and my, my, the most rewarding thing and where I knew it was going to work was before I even finished asking the question, they said yes. And didn't ask anything like, Oh, how many people are you going to have over? How long are you going to be here? They just said, yes. Yeah. Yeah. This is the way, what you did there, Derek is actually you want with a, with a good vibe because some people, if anyone trying to make your life harder as it is, especially when you make film, move on. If somebody say no, good, thank you, move on. Find who says yes. Find a person who see you, you know? Uh, and I mean, see you as an artist, see you as an achiever, as a doer, as somebody who want to do something, as long as it's positive, you know? And this is what I did. He belongs to us, was shot in my apartment in Harlem. You know, uh, the main character was uh, my ex-husband and producer, uh, James Medina, and now he called uh, himself uh, Cleo. So it is, use the resources and don't say, don't put the no's before the yes. You know, don't, don't do that because everyone will tell, uh, 90% of the people there will tell you no, 90%, except your mom, dad, and your loving sister, you know, or girlfriend, yeah or boyfriend, but anyone else, they're gonna say no, because they don't know you. They don't know what you are capable of, uh, what you can give, and you have to give yourself this right to yourself. At least, at the worst things you do that, that you tried, not the harm of trying. It is either you make it or not, and if you don't make it, there's some people die without making anything, without trying anything. They're already dead, <laughs> they just haven't been buried because they never try, you know? And this is my, uh, what I think. So I totally agree with you. I'm very proud and very happy for you that you did your short film. Trust me. No, and I, I appreciate that. I very much appreciate that. So uh, let's talk about your latest film, uh, That Abandoned Place, because yeah, I had the chance to, to watch the film and it, it deals with some very heavy subject matter. And I'm curious to know, because you you wrote and directed this film, how did you conceive this idea from start to finish? And through the process of making it, it did it have an emotional impact on you? Yeah. Uh, I mean, that rented place is a very personal um, piece of work that I... I, I I had to make um, to heal. Uh, now, I'm this kind of artist that I believe that my art has to be part of me, part of the artist. I, so I start writing this script uh, right after uh, me and my uh, ex-husband separated. And I was going through a lot of, um, you know, difficulties in my life. Uh, I was very depressed. Uh, I had a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of issues that I had to deal with it, you know, like I think um, a lot of demons in, in sense, you know, uh, and depression is not a joke. Uh, depression, uh, depression is very, um, it's very, very, uh, how do you say, it's the most uh, evil things going on that unfortunately a lot of people don't admit that it is something serious. Anyway, I, so I start, um, after the separation, I start writing the, the, the script. And actually, I did never wrote it in a sense of script. I wrote it in a sense of uh, images. And you know, sometimes I would be walking around and taking pictures. Um, you know, I would have this vision. I would have these flashes of, uh, you know, these white rooms, you know. I always 
I had that kind of stim, uh, like just random, random uh, sentence that is pop out in my head and I would write it down. Um, I draw most of it actually, rather than I wrote it. So I was like uh, drawing uh, stuff, drawing the characters, drawing. I think everything is a start with an idea. And I think um, I inspired my own self, my broken self as a woman, uh, you know, going through a uh, separation and, uh, you know, anyone who went through difficult relationship and divorce, they will know it is it's re really hard. Grieving is hard because we grieve our relationship. But uh, my broken heart uh, fed my artistic mind and my artistic uh, person. So I inspired myself. Um, and I was like actually kind of looking through my own way of talking and uh, do you know, I don't want to talk about it, but when she's eating the apple in the kitchen, this is exactly pretty much how I, I hung around. So it, it was very close. I wanted to take my broken heart and make it into art. This is not a new concept, okay? We all say, take your uh, broken heart, but really put it in art and make it burnable and make it honest. It's, it was really, really uh, difficult for me. Some of the scene when I when I was on the set, almost I am very good at separating myself when I was a director and as a female, but sometimes you just can't. And um, you know, a lot of it was based on a conversation that really taken took place between me and uh, my ex partner and stuff. So why not? That was an honest thing, and I wanted to share it. Um, uh, and uh, it's just, it's just, I think being artist, you have to be real and honest, especially when you share it with other people, that's all. Uh, so and this is what I did. It was hard. Uh, I don't know, like I haven't seen the film since it's been locked and edited now. Uh, uh, but uh, yeah, I'm very, very proud of that. Um, it's, it's, it really, it's healed me. I needed to do it. I needed to, so I can say I moved on. And, uh, and I think, yes, art can heal. Yeah. Well, I've, I've heard both sides of that argument, but I, I'm, I fall on your side because I, I think there is truth in your art being therapeutic with you putting, you know, in, in your case, your, your pain and your sense of loss and heartbreak that you were feeling into your art can not only create great art in its own way but it can help heal you so i i completely agree 100 percent that you know i i think it can be used as as a measure of healing yeah i mean what it does i know some people saying no you have to separate but look at the end of the day um i'm not an artist for hire I'm an artist for myself, an artist for my work, and my sincerity to myself and to people who's watching my films, my audience, uh, I have to be very sincere. And, um, you know, since I'm doing it myself, I'm not taking money from anyone. I'm not losing anyone money. I'm not, I'm not doing all that side of the I am free and I think being an artist you have to be free to express yourself in the way that you see and the way how you feel the, the moment you put condition on an artist the moment you transfer this artist into a businessman that's it as simple as that artists are meant to be free we are like birds you know <laughs> we have to fly we have to experience you can't you can't I'm sorry, there's a lot of people get sold out. A lot of people will, uh, will sell out. A lot of people will, you know, see the checks and, and, and go, oh, no, I don't want to do that. My life is too short. And I think life is too short in general. And I'd rather just leave something honest, at least, you know. It doesn't have to be good, not uh, millions behind the production, but it has to be sincere. You know, that's just, just sincere, just real. Yeah. Absolutely. No, I, I totally agree. 
But uh, as we start to wrap up here, I did want to ask you, do you have any other projects in the works? And if so, what are they? So, uh, Eric, I do have, uh, but I'm very superstitious in the sense <laughs> I keep it very close to my heart. But um, I can say that I'm uh, going to show, I'm going to have uh, the first time the film to be screened that we went place in Philadelphia on the 4th of November at the Red Spike. And uh, I'm working on that. And uh, the film will be released uh, sometime early in, in the new year. Uh, it's gonna be on demand, that I can say. But anything else, uh, I you will be one of the first people to, to know. <laughs> Absolutely, no, that, that's fantastic though. Uh, what is one piece of advice that you could give to an aspiring filmmaker? So I would say definitely um, don't try. Because if you try, you might get very, very disappointed. But I do say, go for it. Don't ask for green lights. Please, uh, if you have that burning desire in you and you want to just try, just do it. Don't, uh, I know it's hard. I know when, um, you know, self-debating and all, all the negative voices says, no, you can't do it, or you're not good at it. Just try it and see what happened after that. Just give yourself that opportunity to at least give yourself a fair uh, chance in this uh, profession. I love that. And finally, what is, uh, or do you have a website or social media that you'd like to plug so the listeners can follow you? Yes. Uh, so I am on Instagram. Uh, it's Gigi Hosema. Uh, just all together in one word. And uh, my website is uh, look at the world production. Um, and I'm not much in Facebook. I'm not a Facebooker, but definitely I'm on Instagram. Gigi Hussein on Instagram. Yeah, Instagram's a, a much more a positive form of social media. I, I've won that, like I have Facebook, but I don't use it as much as I used to because there's just so much negativity and people bashing yeah. each other instagram you post fun pictures and that's all you do it's great and also like you do have uh, i think again like we have the the the, the that colors and that uh, it's just more practical than facebook and uh, yeah i am an instagrammer more than facebook yeah i yeah. i'm one as well but uh, Gigi, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing your story. This was amazing and inspiring. Thank you so much, Derek, for having me. And I really hope that uh, your audience uh, enjoyed this conversation. And uh, I really hope uh, if they really um, wants to check out the film, I would love to hear them. And uh, I really hope that somewhere someone somewhere that will enjoy this film that I make. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks again to Gigi Hosima for that wonderful and amazing conversation. Be sure to follow her on Instagram to find out what she'll be up to next. And as far as the announcement that I made last week goes, I have made the decision to end the Derek Diamond experience. So you could say this is the first stop on the Derek Diamond experience podcast farewell tour. I've made the decision to end it in the sense that you know, I'm looking for a new challenge when it comes to podcasting and it's not the, I'm not going away. I'm not going to stop podcasting. I'll still be on nerd cave retro every week, but in January I'll be launching my new show feature presentation, which will have some of the elements of this show, but uh, others will be improved on, will be tweaked. And I think everyone will love it. There's going to be a lot of audience participation, some fun conversations that I'm already lining up. So it's going to be a lot of fun. You can follow that show at Feature Prez Pod on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And I'll be launching the show officially on January 5th. And for next week's show on the Derek Diamond Experience, the next stop on the farewell tour, if you will, I thought it would be fun to go back and listen to what is still to this day the most popular show in the history of this podcast, or I should say most popular episode in the history of this podcast. And that is my conversation with the Green Ranger himself, Mr. Jason David Frank, 
who I spoke with back in 2017, leading up to that year's Pensacon. And I'll get into the specifics next week of why the show blew my mind in many aspects. So you'll have that to look forward to on next week's show. But until then, you can check out past episodes of the show on Apple Podcast, Stitcher, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. Just search for The Derek Diamond Experience. And if you could, please leave a review. The more reviews I get, the more visible I become to the podcasting public. If you want to follow me on social media, I'm on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at D Diamond Podcast. I'm also on Patreon at patreon.com slash D Diamond Podcast. And of course, thank you to the Unicorn Wranglers for providing the theme music for the podcast. You can check out all their music on Apple Music, Google Play, and Spotify. That's going to do it for this week's show, so enjoy the rest of your week. Have a safe and fun weekend. Thank you for tuning in to another awesome episode of the Derek Diamond Experience. I'm your host, Derek Diamond, and we'll see you guys back here next Thursday. <laughs>